Unbroken, the podcast with Madeline Black. Healing through storytelling. Hello and welcome to Unbroken, the podcast with me, Madeleine Black. Um, I have been speaking to people that I've met along my journey, inspirational people that have been through tough times, but have bounced back, that have bounced forward in life, and they are now making a difference for other people. And I really believe in the power of sharing our stories. So today, my guest is Emma Jane. Emma Jane was the face of the well-being show for That's TV in 2013 to 2017 and now presents the Emma Jane Show on YouTube, Spotify podcasts. She presents the well-being show on Mid-Morning Matters, the Power Hour for Marlow FM radio and also Be Real, Be You for Inspire Radio. She writes regularly for various social media platforms as well as media connections and publications, including her edit magazine. She's a regular guest on podcasts and other media platforms. She published her book, Don't Hold Back, in 2018, which is her personal and traumatic story of struggle and hardship. And it has given her the positive tools and focus she needed to fight back to create a powerhouse of strength, compassion, and dedication to living. A passionate and authentic speaker with relatable, clear messages, she keeps her audiences engaged with her genuine and insightful knowledge. She spoke at the House of Commons in 2019. She is passionate about supporting people in business and in life. Through her work, she is proud to use her platform to speak and share her positive messages achieved in life. So welcome, Emma Jane. How are you doing? Yeah, great. Gosh, that sounds so busy. <laughs> Just hearing you say all that back. Yeah, and I cut lots out. You, you do loads. You're a really busy woman. Um, so the question that I always start my show with is what does the word unbroken mean to you? Actually, unbroken is being here with you, Madeleine. You know, being here and having that authentic feel about my life, being confident and... Um, and, and trusting and able in myself to be able to have this conversation. I don't know where we're going to go with these com with our questions and conversation now, but it's having the, having the confidence to know that I can do this. I could never have done this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but I can do it now because of my book, because of my authenticity, because of my connections with people like yourself, Madeline. You know, together we are so much stronger and together we're giving a voice of hope to so many. Absolutely. You know, if somebody had told you 10, 20 years ago that you would be writing a book, sharing your story, speaking on podcasts, TV shows, radio shows, what would you have said? I'd be, forget it. I mean, they're not a cat in house chance. I would have stepped up to have this conversation. I was terrified, terrified of speaking up, speaking out. And I think also um, when you've been abused, when you've been rejected, when you've been abandoned, even though you're going through a very difficult time of recovery, when you have been involved and linked with people for as long as I had through my difficult times of the abuse, it's not that you, it's not that you love them and it's not that you like your abusers, but there is an attachment. And most people who've gone through um, a serious amount of abuse for a long amount of time will relate to that. And it wasn't that I was worried about getting them into trouble. I was, I get, I used to get worried about people's feelings, ironically, how people would feel if I said anything negative about them. And so I, I worried about people. I worried about the wrong people. And now when you turn that around and you sort of fast forward to where we are now, it's not that I, I'm not worried about them. Of course, you know, I've forgiven them and, and I've never forgotten, but I've forgiven them because I've had to free myself to move forward. So when I look back onto where th that question of, you know, could I have done this 10 years ago? No, 20 years ago, no, because I was broken myself. I was worried about upsetting people. I was worried about the trouble I might get into for sharing my story. So it was easier just to be quiet, but actually it wasn't easier to be quiet. It was so much harder to live like that. Yeah, so can we go back to the very first time that you were abused? Because you were just little, you were tiny, weren't you? Yes, I was, um, I was nine years old and I was on holiday with my family. And every night I used to go to, well, not every night, but a lot of, a lot of uh, our holiday in the evenings, we'd go to a taverna. We got familiar with people there. We got friendly with the, um, the waiters. We met families there. And so the familiarity was comforting, actually. You go there quite regularly. And as children, there was sort of three or four of us who would meet up. And it was a really, really special time. 
Um, the waiters used to take us out to see the animals when the parents were eating their food, drinking, throat, uh, plate throwing. And, um, and it was nice, it was fine. And then this one night, uh, I will never forget being taken out to the animals and I remember looking over my shoulder and I could see the taverna. It wasn't that far away, but somehow this particular night we went away from the light and we hit a dark area and the coats and the donkeys and the sheep and the cattle and, and do all the lovely animals were there. And I'm, I'm very passionate about animals. And we were there stroking the animals. And then the restaurant owner uh, took me a little bit away from the other group with one of the animals. I remember, I don't know which animal it was. And then, um, I, yeah, I sexually abused me. And it was, even now, I, I feel a bit funny about it because I, at that time, I remember thinking, I, I don't know what this is, but it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I froze. I froze. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. And then after the episode had finished. Normal reaction to freeze, as many yes. women, young men, children can respond, but freezing is so common. Yeah, well, it's your way of coping then, isn't it? Because you've got no other way of um, understanding or coping at that point. You know, as an older woman, you wouldn't deal with it that way. But as a child, that's, 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 how, that's what happened. And so I ran afterwards, after it, after it all finished and we were invited to go back to our parents. I remember running into the bathroom and just feeling uncomfortable, but I didn't know why. And it wasn't until later on, of course, that I did understand what had happened to me. I guess at nine, you wouldn't have the language for that. You no. know what sexual abuse was. No, and I think at nine, you know, nine years, you know, when I, I'm at nine years old back then and nine years old now is a lot different. You're much more aware about these things. You know, I'm a mother now of a 12 year old and I'm, I mean, although she doesn't understand it, she's much more aware of life. I wasn't, you know, I was born in 1972. So this was in 1981. I was a young 80s um, top then. So, yeah, so it was, it was just not knowing. And I think, I remember sort of feeling a bit dirty and it did trigger a little bit of cleanliness at that point, but not as obsessively, which it did later on. Hmm. Yes, because we've spoken before and you've told me about the need to wash yourself a lot, which really resonates with me as well. It was something that I fell into the pattern of doing a lot. Hmm. Yeah, and it's obviously as my life went on, that became a big part of my world. Um, I'm 48 years old now. I mean, I started having baths every night, cleaning, scrubbing, 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 because I wanted to go to bed clean. Um, and uh, now at 48, I still have a bath before I go to bed. But it's, I think there is, there's still a bit of a habitual um, re re um, uh, resonates there. But also, it's a relaxing part of my routine mm -hmm. now. I like to take that control back. I'm not using it to obsessively clean myself, but to relax into my night. So there is a shift in the washing now and the, the yeah there is a shift i mean you know i think age and maturity and wise shoulders and recovery and therapy and everything else that you throw at yourself to get through all these difficult times has definitely helped me understand what it means to my life mm -hmm. and so not long after you were nine you talk about rejection as well just a few years later can you tell us about yeah that? so um I, um, I lived with my mother and my stepfather at, at, from the age of two and I, every other weekend I used to go and see my biological father with my two biological brothers. Um, and it was a really nice time. I, I knew no different. It was happy. It was friendly. My dad was like this, this handsome prince. He was very engaging, he used to make me feel good. Um, he was my, my, my prince really, you know, we used to go and get sweets. Uh, watch nice TV. We used to watch Bruce Forsyth Generation Game every Saturday and uh, just generally have fun. And there were some rumblings in the family. And I, I'm, I, I, at that time, I wasn't really sure what that meant. And then every week, my, one of my brothers would drop off. <laughs> so uh, my elder brother dropped off and then my father would pick me and my middle brother up. And then a few weeks later, he would just pick me up. And I remember looking over my shoulder at my two brothers at the window crying. And I was thinking, oh, and I had butterflies because I wasn't really sure what was going on. Anyway, on this particular weekend, he picked me up as normal. I was happy. I went running out to him, jumped in the car and we went off to the horse riding stables, which is what, where he took me every weekend in, um, in Bray, in Mainhead. And then on the way there, he stopped into a lay-by by a news agent and stopped the car, turned off the engine. And he said, um, look, Emma, there's a bit of a problem in our relationship. 
And, and you're um, old at this point. You're just like I was 11, 11. 11. Yeah, and excited to go horse riding and spend the weekend with my daddy. And then suddenly he's telling me there's a problem in our relationship. And I didn't really have the vocabulary to talk to him, so I just sort of sat and listened. And it was it was really around Mother's Day. Um, he wanted me on Mother's Day, and mothers and it was the weekend. I was uh, sorry, my mum wanted me on Mother's Day, but it was a weekend for my father to see me. Um, and I think just the rumblings of everything that going on in the in the in the life of our family at that time. Now I can look back and realise it was not necessarily that situation. It was another reason for him to move on into his second life and he said to me that it was my decision if I chose to stay with my mother for Mother's Day then he'd have to reconsider our relationship but again at 11 I didn't really understand what that meant and he dropped me off at the horse riding stables I went horse riding stayed with him that night and the next day I remember having to sort of say goodbye to all my my little brothers that lived with him and his new partner and uh, he said, I'll call you tonight. I'll call you tonight at six o'clock. So he did. And he said, what's your decision? And I said, well, I want to see you, daddy. But, you know, it's Mother's Day and I want to be with mummy. And uh, he said, OK, well, look, you've made the decision now. I can't see you again. And I and I didn't really know what to say, what to do. Of course, I'd have talked it through now. I would have I would have communicated it better. And then that was it. I said, OK, daddy, um, bye. And that was it. And he put the phone down. I put the phone down. And I ran out of the house screaming and crying and howling and shaking and everything else uh, because I wasn't really sure what had just happened. And obviously that was it. I'm, I never, I'm 30, 48 now, so 37 years later, I've not seen him since. You never saw him again, did you? That was, he put all that responsibility on an 11 year old shoulder to make that decision. Yeah, and actually, you know, I loved him dearly. Mm. I mean, I absolutely loved him dearly. And I think even though, I completely have done a lot, you know, I completely recovered from that situation. You know, what I get upset about now is how anyone thinks that that's okay to treat a, anyone like that, you know, especially a, your own young child. And um, yeah, he put all that responsibility on me. So not only that now that I felt rejected and abandoned, I had all this fear in my head that if I said or did the wrong thing, I'd lose someone else in my life. So I then became nervous about saying yes or no, because I never really understood what the reaction would be. And would I now lose my mum or my, my, my step family or my siblings? So I then became a very nervous child. Mm -hmm. I tried to make contact with him over the years um, and we, we tried to have some connection. But I think too much had gone on and too much pain had happened. He now blamed me for being, you know, as my life went on, an irresponsible drunk and drug user but had no idea that he was responsible for this um so you know for me it ended up with me having to sort of forgive and move on but yeah really sad time actually um really sad time to to lose someone who was so significant in my life and and I felt very bare and and very empty at that point and it then started triggering my memory from my nine years the nine-year-old situation of abuse and there was more trauma after that as well, wasn't there? Yeah, so um, I then, I was in high school. So uh, ironically, my father, my biological father had wanted me to go to a school near where he lived in Maidenhead. And of course, after um, going to this school, not long after going to this school, I was in sort of a first year, this happened. Um, and so I was now in high school. I was very lonely, very sad. I was nervous. I was sick every day. I was shake. I shook like a leaf constantly. And um, started to, I guess, dislike people, my life, my mum, my stepfather, my family, separated myself away from people because I wasn't sure that people would understand me because, you know, I'd go, I was going through all this hurt and pain. Um, now I understand probably more people were going through this, but at that time you don't understand that. And the school and, just really put you down as a rebellious trouble. Yes, they, they, I started, I, after, not long after starting that senior school, I triggered into bad behaviour. And um, they labelled, they, they threw me into psychiatric care and labelled me a juvenile delinquent without actually understanding there was more than um, this, this going on. And even if that label, which I hate, you were a juvenile delinquent, you weren't born a juvenile delinquent. No, you that was a really was nice behind, girl. Well, couldn't they look at what was behind the label? What was causing you to behave in that way? 
Yeah, and I think that's the that's the thing now, and that's what I want to close the gap on is, you know, if there's someone is going through the difficult times like this, don't slap a label on them, ask them if they're okay, see if you can help, put some thought behind um, or empathy behind the situation. So I then um, fell away from sort of like my family, I hated everybody, and then a, a family acquaintance, I think must have seen the weakness in me, um, and he was a very much older man than me and kind of became my friend. And um, in being my friend, he sucked me into this world of feeling better about myself. Yeah, I have another and, word for that really. I would say that he groomed you. Yes, mm. he did. He started to groom me. And um, once he had pulled me in, he then abused me, degraded me, tortured, bullied me. And how old are you at this stage? I was around 12 or 13 as that started happening. So it's um, one, layer of trauma after another layer after another layer it's not surprising it had to come out of you somehow you know that you did rebel or you were this troubled student as they called you yes i i was very i was very lonely very isolated very confused i was very complicated and i was very dark um everything that i wasn't uh, before <laughs> nine years old you know i was just a just a just a normal, well, I don't know what normal, I don't think we can use normal in any situation. I was a happy person yeah. and now I wasn't a happy person. So I was, um, I spent most of my time on report at school. I was, like I say, labeled a juvenile delinquent, thrown into psychiatric care. And my parent, my mum spent a lot of time at the school trying to stop them from expelling me. And um, I think I was suspended regularly. And I spent most of the latter part of my school years in my headmistress's office or my deputy headmistress's offices taking my lessons because I wasn't trusted um, out of that environment because I was so bad. I mean, I was very naughty. But again, you know, look behind that. Behind that was a really troubled child and being abused and, and sexually abused and degraded and, and raped regularly and fed drugs, fed alcohol. But I disconnected from my family. I disconnected. I didn't really speak to my mum. I hated my stepfather at this time. I hated my family and didn't really have a lot of friends that I did have friends, but I didn't have friends, you know, because I was so isolated on my own journey. I felt very much the victim, I guess. But all that, that behaviour is really, to me, as a psychotherapist, it's your trauma speaking. Yes. Nobody ever asked you the right questions. No. Which and is basically what happened to you or who did what to you. Mm. And that was a big problem, Madeleine. You know, I, I used to have to see it. There was one teacher who was genuinely very nice to me and she used to meet me every week to see how I was. But she wasn't a psychotherapist. She wasn't a counsellor. She just, you know, are you OK? And I used to sit there and cry because I was terrified. I didn't know what to say. I, I, I mean, really, it would have been nice to have met someone like you, Madeleine, back then, because you would have understood how to get out of me what was going on. So this this pointless exercise happened every week. And did it help? Probably not. But I'm sure it offered a little bit of comfort that there was some glimmer of hope that someone was quite nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so this went on until I was around 14, 15 years old. And then I found the confidence to start moving away and stepping away from this dark life and you know understanding what I could do to control it and that was and again you know when I talked at the beginning of this podcast about caring for people who've hurt you when you've spent an amount of time being manipulated and treated so badly by someone it's not that you like them but you've spent so much time with them it's like a, an abuse case you know you're still drawn to the emotions of that person because they've they've kind of cared for you for such a long time and then suddenly you feel the strength to step away. How did you find that strength to step away? I don't know. And I often ask myself that. <laughs> what was it? And I think maybe it was sort of going into those latter hormonal years where you do start thinking differently. I actually personally think I'm quite behind mentally in my development because of everything. And even now at 48, even though in I... In maturity, you mean? Yeah, in my development, in my maturity, because... Um, even now at 48, I, I consider myself a worldly woman, um, but there are still things I think I have delayed reactions to because of how I've had to cope and understand what I've needed to do through my life. So how did I step away? I think it was the latter part of my teenage years and I, I, be, I became a bit closer to some of my friends and um, boys, different boys came in, in and showed some interest in me. 
And I think then you start realizing, actually, is this normal for to me to be spending so much time with a very older man? And then how much older was he than you? So I would say when I was, um, he was in his late forties when I was around twelve or thirteen, so thirty odd years older, um, which is a lot. Yeah. It was a lot of years and you were a child <laughs> yeah and um and then you've got boys of your age 15 16 70 year olds showing interest in you and it becomes a bit of a different story so I still never talked about it but I did start going into the direction of other friends and other relationships not as serious relationships because I think I was too damaged for that um so when did you find your voice um when I was um 40 oh no so when I started my therapy I was 22 mm -hmm. and when I actually spoke out publicly I was 45. It's a process isn't it it doesn't really happen overnight. No and if anyone who says it does then then gosh I don't know how you've done that because I went I started my therapy at 22 when I started my business and um, my business and my therapy went parallel it was like on the same kind of journey as my business grew, I got more focused on my therapy and recovered. And, and it was, like I say, it was a good, It was you know, a journey of self-improvement in all areas, really, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, when I went to my therapist for the first time, I think I cried for an hour. I don't think I even said a word. It was almost just such a relief to get into that room. And I just get a sense of the nine-year-old, the 11-year-old, the 13-year-old is the one that's doing all that crying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I did a lot of, I did an A to Z of therapy over the next sort of 20 years. Um, and, you know, I went through traditional counsellors, psychotherapists, uh, Reiki, uh, holistic treatments. And then when I got to um, probably my mid 30s, I found the strength to go and see this psych psychotherapist or psych psychiatrist, psychotherapist. And I hadn't had the confidence to do that, but it felt right now. I felt I could do and go and see him. And he was a hypnotherapist as well. And gosh, I mean, he, he took me into the most difficult situations, but the most liberating of everything, because uh, I had the confidence now to do it. But, you know, anyone going through any recovery, going back to your dark times, isn't an easy process. No. Um, and, and like you say, Madeline, it's about reconnecting with my inner child, which I have to do a lot of, actually. Um, even now, I sometimes go back there just to check in, um, because even though I feel like I'm, I use the, recur, recur, the word recovered, I also understand that it's still a journey, yeah. because anyone who's gone through any trauma, it's part of who you are, and occasionally there will be a trigger and a trip. So, you know, when I get to that point, I understand the tools that I've got to reconnect and understand where I've got to go back to. And where did you first share your story when you spoke publicly when you were in your 40s? So um, I was invited to uh, an Amedia um, event. It was when I was starting to talk about my book. So it was when, in 2017, 2016, Sarah Parfit, a very good friend of mine, a media friend of mine sort of said to me, come and sort of dip your toe in. And I did, and it was very gentle, uh, just a very light conversation. But then I was asked to be in the front cover of a magazine for Venus magazines. And it was then that they said, would I compare their event? Would they, could they share my business story because of my business growth? I said, yep, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I also feel now it's the right time for me to talk about my personal story. So I, 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 put, I dab, dip, dipped my toe in with, you know, maybe my life wasn't always so good. Then they, then they did a videography of me where I, where I felt much more confident to share my story. And uh, so the first real time was in front of about 400 people <laughs> at wow. a football stadium. And uh, I have to say, I, when, when my chaperone called me to the stage, he, he said, EJ, it's time to go. It's time to go. I was on the front cover of all these magazines. They were all in the room and it was all spectacular. And they'd just done a videography of me on the big screens in the football stadium. My parents were there, my family, my friends. And uh, they said, right, EJ, it's time to go. I, I, I had a little bit of sick in my throat. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> and they said, right, they pushed me down the runway uh, onto the stage and I started talking. And at that, when I, I mean, I don't speak with cards now, but when I did on that first occasion, I was shake. I could have bought, I could have drilled holes all around the town. I was shaking so much. I was terrified. 
Anyway, halfway through my speech, I just stopped myself and I took a breath because I thought, you know, I'm going to either pass out or be sick or something. And this is going to be and the most embarrassing night in my life. And uh, I said, I'm sorry, this is the first time I spoke about this. I'm really nervous. And the whole room just went, ah, oh, and they breathed. And then you know, after that first night, people were coming up to me, thanking me, saying, you know, you've given me some confidence. Seeing you so raw and authentic up there has made me realise I need to go and see somebody. So it opened the door to other opportunities and people to go and get their, find their voice. And that, I always said, if it would help one person, I've done exactly what I set out to do, which was to give back a hope. Well, it's giving hope to others, but it's also about you standing in that fear, feeling it, but doing it anyway. And that's the only way I think we conquer our fears, isn't yes. it? Rather than running from them. And you always say that you can't fight pain with pain. You know, you've got to really be gentle with yourself. Yeah, and embrace it. You know, I embrace pain every day in some way, shape or form, whether it be professionally or personally, something always comes up. It might be a little episode, it might be a major episode, but instead of going, I'll deal with that tomorrow, or I look at that next week, I always go, right, what do I need to do? What do I need to do now to get this in an engagement with this process of sorting it out? Mm -hmm. It might be that I have to start engaging it for next week. It might be that I have to start engaging it for the end of the month, but I will get the engagement because then I'm back in the driver's seat and I'm controlling it. It's not controlling me. And I think if I can control any emotion or feeling, it will make me feel much more complete. Yeah, it's putting your focus on what you can do, really, isn't it? Rather than what you yes. can't do, which is brilliant advice. So what was the process of writing your book? Uh, because I really loved Don't Hold Back because it's it does tell your story, but it also is filled with practical advice for people to kind of, a bit like a workbook really, isn't it? At the end yes. of the chapter, questions to ask yourself and, and send a reader on their own journey of inquiry. So it's very cleverly done. I liked that. Thank you, Madeleine. Well, when I started, re when I started um, writing it, I, I drafted a little bit saying, I'm Emma Jane Taylor. Um, this is my professional life. I've also gone through some difficulties. Um, and through my difficulties, this is how I've gone through and to get to the other side. Anyway, a very a good friend of mine, he's, a, he's quite a well-known author. Uh, he said, he looked at it and he said, EJ, you can't just put that. People need to know your story. And I was like, oh, I don't know. So I, then I, I do a little bit more. When I was nine, I was used. When I was 11, my father left. When I was da 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 da, -da. Um, And because of this, I've, I've managed to understand what my growth is. He's like, EJ, forget that you need to put that story out there because everyone needs to be able to relate to it to understand it's a, been a big journey for you um and so yeah i started writing and i cried every night until i got my story bit done because it was again liberating I did, i've done all this 20 years of therapy now i'm putting it into paper now i've put it into paper over the 20 30 years but i've always deleted it uh, I've never saved it and this time I was saving it and it was making it very real and attaching it to me and making like that whole process of me because before I, I wasn't authentic I mean I just kept shrugging things off and pushing them away now I was like feeling it it was part of who I am it was part of my journey so yeah so the writing I did my story I worked with um, Vision Maker Press who encouraged me to break down and um, suggest that we talked very much about how each uh, chapter would be broken down. I wanted it to be very much of a motivational tool book, a workbook, because mm -hmm. at that point, that's what I felt was right for my life and for it, my work. It absolutely is. It makes you think, well, if she can get through all that, surely I can get through whatever I'm struggling with. Yes. And it gives hope, doesn't it? Yes. And, you know, it, it's, it's written from a very real place, very authentic place and a place that makes me feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. So I know the book's been written, uh, read across the globe. I've been interviewed by people in Japan, spoken to people in Australia. And so, you know, whether they leave reviews or not doesn't matter. The fact that I know that people are connecting around the world. In fact, a lot of girls in um, Southeast Asia have um, found it very helpful to their life. And what does it feel now to know that your story's out there, it's down in black and white and people are reading it? I feel really proud of my journey. You know, I often say I, I would never want to relive my journey, but I would never change my journey. 
because I've understood the the goodness that it's brought to my life and therefore other people's life. So I'm very proud um, that I've been managed to do it, that I've managed to find my authentic self mm -hmm. and not and not, you know, and I've taken the BS away, you know, I totally understand that and have said very similar things about my own journey yes never wishing on anyone else but yeah uh, i kind of wonder who would you be without all of that you know would you be this thriver this shining bright yes. light that you are this person that's now motivating others to find their voice and live their true authentic life and you never know and i remember bumping into my abuser okay. once and i was now in my 20s i'd started my therapy I was becoming more confident, even though very, very nervous and, and, and troubled in many ways. Um, and he was stood in front of me in a queue in a shop. And uh, as soon as I saw the, the back of him, I remember thinking, <gasps> and I went, I felt really nervous and I was shaking and I thought I, I need to get out of this queue, but something kept me there. because I was thinking, no, I've got to stand here. He must have felt my eyes boring into the back of him because he turned around to me and saw me and he's now an even older man and uh he took one look at me and he came out of the queue and he walked out and that was very empowering for me it was very couldn't empowering face couldn't face me and walked out and he was probably worried at that point I, you know i was quite a you know volatile person as well at that point as I was growing up very very dangerous in very many ways you know so I'm sure he may have thought oh I need to get out of here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you say in your book very near to the end is that everything we want is on the other side of fear. Yes and that couldn't be more true for all of us and whether you're looking at that through professional eyes or personal eyes we can get anything we want if we can just understand how to step over that fear, hurdle fear. A hurdle fear is a really good way to call it because it's so disabling, isn't it? When we're filled with fear, how it holds us back and how we believe the lies that fear feeds us. Yeah, and you know what? Well, obviously, I, I, uh, I started drinking and I was taking drugs. I became bulimic. I had terrible OCD tendencies. I, I could, sometimes I could barely get out of the house. I was having night terrors. I needed to wee all the time. I was just nervous. I was paranoid. I was very panicky. And, you know, when you're living in this world, just drowning, just drowning in uh, negative emotions, fear. And I don't think I was suicidal as such, but I, there were times where I didn't want to live. And it's I think exhausting. that was, Listening. yeah, it was exhausting. It must have been exhausting. Yeah. And I think, you know, and then when you start to step away from that and then obviously PT, PTSD caught up with me and it took me years to understand what that really meant to my life. Um, it was exhausting. And it was when my father, my stepfather, when I was um, 19, he had a heart operation. We thought we might lose him. And it was at that point that my life started changing because this was a man who I have now hated for years and years and years. Not, but well, not really, you know, I just, I was so horrible to my parents and um, blame them for everything. And now suddenly he's in intensive care. And uh, it was a real light bulb moment for me because I went to see him and he was lying there wired up on life support machine. And uh, I get emotional about it now thinking. And, uh, I suddenly realized he was the only man that had loved me yeah. and he was the only man who'd stood by me and protected me and cared for me even though I treated him terribly over the years and now here he is lying helpless. It's kind of a real bittersweet moment isn't it? Yes. It's, it's and that realization of unconditional love. So I sat on his bed and I said please don't leave me uh, I love you and uh I will always love you. Anyway, he started to get better and I stayed with him every single day. I mean, they were trying to get me out of the hospital. And I went then after that, after he, got, after he got home, I went to Spain on and off for about three years. And that was after that, I was like, right, I need to sort my life out. Um, and uh, my father and my stepfather is still with us now, 84 years really? old. Oh, uh, he's a massive influence in my life in you know, a real big key, key person to my recovery as well. 
and they have understanding now in, into what you went through obviously yes I, it's, it's it's been very difficult for them obviously because you know when when you go back all those years you know what how we're talking now you just didn't have these conversations back in the day you just you just didn't not because no one cared just no one knew how to or understood the importance of it um but my parents are very good at communication as well and I think you know there was a lot of children between them and we were all going through our difficulties and and I think when you assume I guess rightly or wrongly that the troubles are because of what happened with my biological father you do what you can to a uh, facilitate that but of course now they understand the problems were much bigger and of course they also recognize what was going on in in sort of like from 12 13 onwards because they remember now um that person and turning up all that, into place really don't they when yeah they and i think they remember place. now some of the the situations um and now obviously realize that what was maybe they thought was someone helping and looking after me they realized that it was it wasn't Mm -hmm. and so that's caused them some difficulties but you know it's not their fault no it's not um what would you say your biggest learning out of all of your experience has been well i was interviewed on a bbc documentary a few years ago and they asked me this question what were my regrets and i don't like to have regrets but having to give an answer i would say my biggest regret was that i didn't speak up sooner so I take that as my learning. And I think we learn all the time. I'm learning now, um, every day, every second, I'm, I'm, I'm taking an education with me. So my education is, we have a voice, we can use it. You don't have to speak like we do in, on a podcast, in a book, on a stage. You can just speak to a therapist or a friend or a family member because you're never alone. And you know what? Someone somewhere does love you. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you for some tips to round off, but I think that is a fantastic place to end our interview here. So, Emma Jane, I just want to thank you so much. Just keep on shining your beautiful light that you do. You are really giving hope to so many people. And I echo what you say about finding the voice and it's never too late to find your voice and speak out. So thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you, Madeleine. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, and the work that you do is incredible. And obviously, I know, I know you and I follow you. And I think what you're doing is remarkable, too. Thank you so much. Unbroken, the podcast with Madeleine Black, playing now on all the main platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher for Android, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and here, play Unbroken, the podcast with Madeline Black.